to be in the bubble. <laughs> Love it. Aren't you all the luckiest people in the world? Oh my God, I envy you. <sighs> Hi, Amanda. Hi, Oprah. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> so we have been so excited and eagerly anticipating this day. This campus has been buzzing since the announce announcement was made last week that you'd be coming here. And Thanks I received... for the buzz. <laughs> I'm so re... glad you know I still have buzz. So good. I received a lot of support and advice from my friends, and that was really great. And I just wanted to say, I think the best advice I heard was, don't worry, Amanda, if you mess up, Oprah can just interview herself. <laughs> <laughs> so if I falter, feel free to ask yourself some questions, and we'll, and we'll begin. Um, but to get things started, I, want, I thought we'd frame today's talk with um, framing three sections with quotes of yours that you shared after wrapping up your 25th season and final season of The Oprah Winfrey Show. And I thought some of these quotes, I mean, you share so much wisdom, but these really spoke to me and I thought would be a great way to frame our discussion. Okay. So this first one that I will read for everyone and for you so you don't have to strain your neck <laughs> is... Um, you have to know what sparks the light in you so that you, in your own way, can illuminate the world. So I wanted to take this time to talk about your early career and how you discovered your calling. So let's go back to when you were college age. Did you know that you wanted to get into TV and media specifically? No, I did not. I thought that I was going to be a teacher. Um, I was in my sophomore class at Tennessee State University. I'd already been working in radio since I was 16. And my, um, I remember I was in Mr. Cox's uh, drawing class for theater, and I was a terrible drawer. He said I couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler. <laughs> and, uh, and I got a call in that class from a guy at uh, the local station, CBS, and he'd been calling me several times when I was working in radio. Um, so I started working in radio at 16. I won the Miss Fire Prevention Contest, another long story. And uh, so when I went back to the station to pick up my prize, some guy said, would you like to hear your voice on tape? I said, sure. And I started reading this copy on tape. They called everybody in the building, said, hear this kid read. I was 16, they hired me in radio. So I was in radio at 16 and so I started getting calls about um, my freshman year to come into television. I had never thought about it. And still was living at home and couldn't figure out how I would manage those. I had biology at <laughs> one o'clock. And so I, I, I couldn't figure out how I would be able to manage my schedule. And Mr. Cox said to me, the one same, same professor said, you can't draw a straight line with a ruler, he said, I came back from, from uh, taking this phone call, and he said, who is that? I said, there's this guy at CBS. He keeps calling me. He wants me to interview for a job. And Mr. Cox said, that is why you go to school, fool. <laughs> so that CBS can call you. <laughs> that is why you're in school. So I, he said, you, you leave now and go call him back. And, and uh, I did, and I was hired in television. Not knowing anything about it, mm -hmm. uh, having in mind Barbara Walters, but thinking, oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, not knowing how to write or film or anything. Mm. And I think it was because it was, the, it was the times, and I literally had somebody who was willing to work with me that I, that I managed to, to find my way but I had to find my way right. because the reporting never really fit me. And mm. what did work for me, I'm this old, I'm so old that when I started that um, it was a year of live action cam. <coughs> and so it was like video cameras live. And so the news stations would do a live, a live shot. They would throw to somebody live, even if nothing was going on, just so they right. could say live action <laughs> cam. <laughs> And what I found is I wasn't so good at the writing part, mm -hmm. but if I was just standing up and talking about what had just happened, it was really good. Right. And then I started to feel 
So I started in 19, working in television, became an anchor immediately afterwards. My father still had an 11 o'clock curfew. Can you believe such a thing? <laughs> that I am, I am the 10 o'clock anchor. <laughs> In Nashville, Tennessee, I am the woman on the newscast reading the news. And my father would say, be home by 11. And I'd say, Dad, the news is on at 10. He goes, and it's off at 10.30, so be home by 11. <laughs> so I, I had a very strict, very strict father. So anyway, I, I could feel inside myself mm -hmm. that reporting was not the right thing for me, even though I was happy to have the job. Right. I got an offer to go to Atlanta. I was making $10,000 a year in 1971, but still in college, so I was thinking I was doing pretty good. Yeah. I got an offer to go to Atlanta for 40000 which I thought, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make $40,000. And my boss at the time said to me, you do not know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and you need to stay here until you can learn to write better, until you... Uh, can perfect your craft as, as a journalist. And so I, I, he said, and we can't give you 40, but we can give you 12. So, <laughs> so I stayed. And you, you know, the reason why I stayed is because I could feel inside myself that even though the 40 was alluring at the time, that he was absolutely right. So to make a long story short, because I'd be here all day just talking about how it all came about, I started listening to what felt like the truth for me. Mm. A couple of years later, I moved to Baltimore. I could feel that as a reporter, and by this time, 22, I'm making 22,000. I met my best friend, Gail, there, who said, oh my God, can you imagine if you're 30 and you're making 30,000? <laughs> and then you're 40 and then it's 40,000? <laughs> um, we actually had that conversation in the bathroom. <laughs> So this is, I started to feel that reporting wasn't for me, but I had my father, I had my friends, everybody was saying, oh my God, you're, you're an anchor woman, you're on mm -hmm. TV, I mean, you can't give up that job. Right. And when I was, by the time I was making 25, my father goes, well, you just hit the jackpot, you're not gonna make no more money than that, that's just it. <laughs> so I was torn between what the world was saying to me and what I felt to be the truth for myself. It felt like an unnatural act for me reporting, although I knew that to a lot of people it was glamorous. And I started to just inside myself think, what, what, what do I really want to do, what I right. really want to do? And I will say this, knowing what you don't want to do is the best possible place to be if you don't know what to do. Because knowing what you don't want to do leads you to figure out what is it you, you really do. do want to do. So you discovered talk then, right? around that time? I didn't discover talk, I was being, I got demoted. They oh. wanted to fire me, but I was, I was under contract for, and they didn't want to give up the 25,000. So right. they were trying to keep me on to the end of the year. So they put me on this talk, this is the way life works. They put me on a talk show to try to avoid having to pay me the contract out. And the moment I sat on the talk show, interviewing the Carvel ice cream man and his multiple flavors. <laughs> I knew that, that I had it. found home for myself. Because when I was a news reporter, it was so unnatural for me I, you know, to cover somebody's tragedies and difficulties and then to not to have feel anything for it. And I would go back after mm. a fire and I would take them blankets and then I would get a note from my boss saying, what the hell are you doing? Right. You're just supposed to report. Can't be that it. empathetic. You can't can no. not be that empathetic. And it felt unnatural for me. So um, if I were to put it in business terms it, it, or, or to leave you with a message, that the truth is I have from the very beginning listened to my instinct. All of my best decisions in life have come because I was attuned to what really felt like the next right move for me. And so it didn't feel right. I knew that I wouldn't be there forever. I never even learned the streets in Baltimore because I thought, I was there longer than I thought. I was there eight years. I should have learned the streets. <laughs> but I kept saying to myself, I'm not going to be here long. I'm not going to be here I'm not going to be here, so I'm not, I'm not going to learn the streets. So when I got the call to come to Chicago, <laughs> after you know, starting uh, with a, with a co-anchor and, and working in, in talk, 
for several years, I knew that it was the right thing to do. And I knew that if I d even if I didn't succeed, because at the time there was a there was a guy named Phil Donahue yeah. who was the king of mm -hmm. talk, and was on in Chicago, and every single person except my best friend Gail said you're going to fail. Every single person when I left, all that, my bosses by this time thought I was terrific and said, you're gonna, you're, you're, you're walking into a landmine, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail, Chicago's a racist city, you're black, you're not gonna make it. Everything to, to keep me staying. They then offered me a car and an apartment and all this stuff. And I said, no, if I fail, then I will find out what is the next thing for me, what is the next right. true thing for me. It felt right to you, so you went for it. Because it felt like this is now the move I need to make. And I was not one of those people, you know, all of my, um, the people who worked with me in news, they would have their tapes and they'd have their stories and they'd have you know, uh, resumes ready. I didn't have any of that because I knew that the time would come mm -hmm. where, I would, where what I needed would show up for me. Okay. And when that showed up, I was ready because my definition of luck is preparation meeting the moment of opportunity. Right. And I was pre prepared to be able to step into that, 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 that world of talk in a way that I, I knew I could do it. Great. So often in your career, I'm sure you are a minority, perhaps as the only woman, the only black person, the only person from a poor family. Uh, did this affect you on your professional path? And how did you navigate situations in which you might have felt more alone? Mm. And now, how did that impact how you lead and how you might help people who may be feeling that same thing? Okay, man, that's a lot of questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let's. I mean, I, I, man, let's, I have to put me, my glasses on. I figured I had you here. I was gonna, I was gonna ask as much as I could. Um, so Amanda went deep on me there for a minute there. Whoa! Back up, sister girl. Come on, back up. First one is. So, how did you navigate situations in which you might have felt more alone? Always the only, only woman in the room. Mm. Still walk in, only woman in the room and there's a room full of white men, usually older. Um, thrills me, just thrills me. I just, I just love it. Um, usually the only black person in the room. Also, never really concerned me because I, I don't look at people through color. I didn't get to be where I am by, and who I am by looking at uh, the color of people's skin. I really, literally took Martin Luther King at his word uh, and understand that the content of a person's character and refuse to let anybody else do that to me. So I love it, just <laughs> love it. And um, there's a wonderful phrase by Maya Angelou from a poem that she wrote called um, To Our Grandmothers that she says, when I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So when <clears throat> I walk into a room and particularly before I have something really challenging to do or I'm going to be in a circumstance where I feel I'm going to be, you know, up against um, some difficulties, I will literally sit and I will call on that 10,000. Mm -hmm. I will call on the, the ancestors. I will call on those people who've come before me. I will call on the women who forged a path that I might be able to sit in the room with all of those white men and love it so much. Uh, I, 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 call on, I call on that right. because I know that my being where I am, and first of all, being who I am right. and where I am, it didn't come just out of myself, that I come from a heritage. And so I own that mm -hmm. and I step into that room, not just as myself, but I bring all of that, 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 that energy with me. So it has never been an issue for me, except when I was, I think, 23, still working in, uh, working in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I'd gone to my boss and said uh, that the guy who was working with me, co co uh, my co-host on the People Are Talking show, was making more money than I. And we were, we were co-hosts. So I went to my boss and I said, this is in 1970, so I was older than 23. It was 1979, 80. And I said, I, I just would like to, you know how intimidating it is to go to the boss in the first place, oh, but I'm going to go and I'm going to stand up for myself. <laughs> and I said, Richard's making more money than I am. And I, I, and I don't think that's fair because we're doing the same job. We sit in the same show. We do the same. And 
my general manager said, why, why should you make as much money as he? And I said, because we're doing the same job. And he said, um, but he has children. <laughs> Do you have children? And I said, no. He said, well, he has to pay for college educations. He, has, he owns his own home. Do you own your home? I said, no. He said, he has uh, a mortgage to pay. He has insurance. He has a, do you have that? No. So t tell me, why, you, why do you need the same amount of money? And I said, thank you for your time. And I left. Mm -hmm. I left. I didn't complain about it. I didn't file a, a, a suit about it. I knew that in that moment, it was time for me to go. And that I started the process for myself of preparing myself for you will not be here long. You are not going to be able to get what you need. I had a boss at the time uh, who w was African American and had just been, uh, for the first time, made an assistant news director and was drunk with power, drunk with power, mm -hmm. and felt it his, I think, I don't know, I think he woke up in the morning thinking of things he could do to harass me. I decided not to file a suit against it because I knew at the time I would lose. Right that no good would come of it, that I would be blackballed in television, that it would turn into a major thing. And I knew I didn't have long to stay there. I had a vision for what the future was, even though I couldn't place exactly where my future would be. I knew uh, who held the future, because I am really guided by a force that's bigger than myself. I know that my being here on the planet is not just of my own making. So you use that as momentum to just leave, cut your losses, and no, go? No, I just I did, I filed it away. I go, yeah. there will come a time. <laughs> it's going to come back. Yeah, you were right. I think you were or right. I will be sitting in the same room, and it happened. Like in the late 90s, I had the Oprah show, and I ran into that guy. Lord Jesus, thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, one of the sweetest moments I've ever had. <laughs> oh, go ahead. OK. <laughs> here we go. So right now, as we sit here, yeah. we're about five miles from Facebook mm -hmm. and Sheryl Sandberg. And last year, she published the book Lean In, and it has gotten incredible traction. It had some you know, criticism as well. And I was wondering, if you were to write a book on women in careers, what would your title be? Mine would be, actually, um, Mine wouldn't be lean in, it would be step up and step into up. yourself. Because this is the truth, there is no real doing in the world without being first. For me, being your presence, your connection to yourself and that which is greater than yourself is far more important than what you do, but also is the thing that fuels what you do. Right. And I know that one of the things uh, that is so important for what happens here uh, at the graduate school is that you have leaders who are self-actualized and understand what your contribution to change the world can be. You can only do that if you know yourself. You can only do that unless you take, unless you, you cannot do it unless you take the time to actually know who you are and why you are here. Now, I happen to know for sure that every human being comes, comes called. And that the calling goes beyond um, the definition of what your job is. That there is, innate, there is an innate, supreme moment of destiny for everybody. And that's why when I was in Baltimore, I could feel this isn't it, mm -hmm. this isn't it. And then in Chicago, uh, after 25 years of success on the show, I started to feel this isn't it, there's something more, something more, something more that's calling me to what is the supreme moment. And everybody has that. And you cannot um, fulfill it unless you have a level of self-awareness to be connected to what is the inner voice or the instinct, I call it your emotional GPS system, uh, that allows you to make the best decisions for yourself. And every decision that has profited me mm -hmm. has come from me listening to that inner voice first. Yes. And every, dis every 
time I've gotten into a situation where I was in trouble, it's because I didn't listen to it. I overrode that voice, that instinct, with my own, with my own head and my own thinking. I tried to rationalize it, I tried to tell myself, but, you know, okay, you're gonna make a lot of money, oh no. <laughs> and so, I am, I sit here, uh, you know, profitable, successful, by all the definitions of the world. But what really, really, really resonates deeply with me is that I live a fantastic life. My inner life is really intact. My, I live from the inside out. And so everything that I have, I have because I let it be fueled by who I am and what I realize my contributions to the planet could be. Mm -hmm. And what my real contribution is, it looks like I'm a, I was a talk show host. It looks like you know I'm in the movies. It looks like you know I have a network. But my real contribution, the reason why I'm here, yep. is to help connect people to themselves and the higher ideas of consciousness. I'm here to help raise consciousness. So my television platform was to help raise consciousness. In the beginning, I didn't realize that. I thought, oh my god, I got a show! <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until um, I was interviewing the Ku Klux Klan one day. And can you imagine, all the great lessons come from things that are, that are sometimes challenging. I was interviewing the Ku Klux Klan, and I thought, as an African American, oh, I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna show for every Jewish person, for every person who's been uh, discriminated against. And during the commercial break, I saw the Klan exchanging uh, signals and looks at each other. And then something inside, that instinct, I thought, I am doing nobody any good. They are loving this. They are using <laughs> me. I think I'm doing an interview. Right. They are using me. I did not know it at the time. I brought them on, actually, those same guys back in, uh, for my last year. And they told me that they used that show for their recruitment. I could feel that happening. And I made a decision. Uh, after that show, I'll never do anything like that again. I'll never let my platform be right. used, and I will not be Same. used. And at the time in the 90s, early 90s, everybody was doing confrontational television. And I thought I was above the fray, because I'm not like Jerry Springer, I don't do that. <laughs> so in my egoic delusion, I thought, because I am not that bad, I'm really not bad. But I was doing confrontational television. I thought I was exposing men with affairs. We happened to have a guy on who was talking about um, how he'd had an affair with his wife. And he was crazy enough to come on with his wife and his girlfriend. People ask me, why do people do that? It's because nobody ever asked him. So <laughs> you say, would you come on with your wife and your girlfriend? He goes, sure. Um, <laughs> He was thinking. He was thinking. So he comes on with the wife and the girlfriend. This is a life-changing moment for me, the clan and this woman. Mm -hmm. The wife is there, he's in the center, and the girlfriend. And he tells his wife, he announces, we were live television at the time, and he announced that to, to, to the world and to his wife that his girlfriend was pregnant. And I did, you see your face, your mouth's open right there. <laughs> I did exactly that, I went, God. And you could hear the gasp in the audience. And, the thing. and I literally, really, it still makes my eyes water to think about it. I looked at her face and I felt her humiliation. I felt her shame. I felt it. And I said, never again. I will get out of television if I have to do this. And I went and I had a meeting with the producers because I just had the clan before and I got the adulterers here. And... Uh, <laughs> Some uplifting show, I must say. <laughs> uh, and I said to the producers, we are gonna change, we're gonna turn this around, mm -hmm. and I'm no longer gonna be used by television. I am going to use television. What a concept. I'm gonna use television as a force for, for, I didn't say at the time for good, I said, you know, let's think about what we wanna say to the world yeah. and how we wanna use this as a platform to speak to the world. How do we want to see the world change? How do we want to impact the world and then let all of our shows really be focused and centered around that? I then said to the producers exactly what I said to you backstage. Mm -hmm. Do not bring me a show 
unless you have fully thought out what is your intention for doing it. Because if there is, if, if, if there is a religion or a mantra or law that I live by, I live by the third law of motion in physics, which is Stanford, uh, which is <laughs> for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That is, that is, that is, that is my religion. I know that what I'm thinking and therefore going to act on is going to come back to me in, this, in, a, in, a, in a circular motion, just like gravity, like what goes up comes down. And so what also propels the action is the intention. So I don't do anything without being fully clear about why I intend to do it, because the intention is going to determine the reaction, the result, or the consequence in every circumstance. I don't care what it is. So I said to my producers, come to me with your intention at whatever it is, whatever shows you're proposing, whatever ideas you're proposing. And then I will decide based upon the intention, do I really want to do right. that? Is this how we want to use this platform? And that really is the secret to why we were number one all those years, is because it was an intention-fueled, intention-based, coming out of purposeful Goodness. programming. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was. Great, and that's a perfect segue to go to our second section, which I read this quote and it just struck me as so true and I wanted to delve into it. I've talked to nearly 30,000 people on this show and all 30,000 had one thing in common. They all wanted validation. I will tell you that every single person you will ever meet shares that common desire. So. Oprah, you are a true renaissance woman. You know, you have your own network. You had this amazingly successful show for 25 years. You've been in movies. You are one of the most important philanthropists of our time. So what are the qualities? I love hanging around you. What else should I say? <laughs> I'm just taking it all in. Really. I love it, too. No, so we... <laughs> you know, the part I love the most is renaissance woman. As you said that, I went, what does that really mean? But... <laughs> I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> I was a history major, so it seemed like I'm a natural. I'm a Renaissance woman. <laughs> Who knew? OK, go ahead. Good. I'm glad you like it. Um, <laughs> what are the qualities of your leadership that make you successful at such diverse pursuits? Mm. And what works for, in one area that maybe doesn't work in another? <clears throat> well, I tell you, it, it works in all areas because I, my life is fueled by my being. And the being fuels the doing. So I come from a centered place. I mm -hmm. come from a focused place. I come from compassion. Um, it's, just, it's just my nature. I come from a willingness to understand and to be understood. Right. And I come from wanting to, to, to connect. I mean, the secret of that show for 25 years is that people could see themselves in me all over the world, they could see themselves in me. And even as I became um, more and more uh, financially successful, which was a big surprise to me, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. Um, you mean you got more than that 30,000? I got more than 30,000 by the time I was 30. So, <laughs> so my, so, but what, what I realized is through the whole process, because I'm grounded, in my own self, that although I could have more shoes, my feet stayed on the ground, although I was wearing better shoes. These are kind of cute today, too. Uh, so I could keep my feet on the ground, even though I could get more shoes. And I could understand, I could understand that it really was because I was grounded. I've, I've done the, was doing and continue to this day to do the consciousness work. I work at staying awake. And mm -hmm. being awakened is just another word for spirituality, but spirituality throws people off and they think you mean religion. When I was hiring people for my company, for own, uh, for looking for presidents, uh, when people would come in, I'd say, tell me, what is your spiritual practice? And literally, would throw people, I'm dumb, well, the, I, well, I'm not religious. Or I said, I didn't ask you about your right. religion. I asked you what's your spiritual practice. What do you do to take care of yourself? What do you do to keep yourself centered? What do you do to the, and uh, you know, one woman started crying, you know that's not the person. 
<laughs> so that's a sign. That's a sign. So, so to answer your question, yeah. everything is fueled that comes from me really wanting to be a better person on earth. And this is what I know to be true. The reason why the show worked is because I understood that that audience, my viewers, the people who watched us every day and would come and just like you all did, uh, get tickets and they would come with their, you all just came across campus, but that's good too. But, <laughs> but people would come from all over the world just to be there with their aunts and their mothers and they'd come with their cousins and there'd be a few men in there going, what the hell? <laughs> or saying, well, I went to Oprah with you. I went to Oprah. <laughs> And all at least give me clear for three or four weeks. I went to Oprah with you. I had such regard for that. And I just had a conversation with John Mackey, who runs Whole Foods yeah. and has written this fabulous book. You should get it called um, Conscious Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how the investment in the stakeholders, the people who you are serving, that connection between the people who you're trying to serve and sell to is equally as important as the people who you're buying from, right. equally as important as the people who are you know, supporting you financially, um, as your stockholders if you are you know, you know, a public company. So I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times I might have had better shoes, but at the core, yeah, the so core of, of, of what really matters, that we are the same. Yeah. And you know how I know that? because all of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you want to be, and that may be, the, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake mm -hmm. pies for people or bake cakes for people or to offer your gift, then, then that's, that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me, except that's, how, that's your platform, mm -hmm. that's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to reach you know, everyone. To, to, to reach everyone. And, and there's no way that you wouldn't because that's, that's what I truly feel. And when I sit down to talk to somebody, whether I'm talking to a murderer, I sat down, I interviewed a guy who'd um, killed his twin daughters. I've interviewed child molesters, trying to figure out what, what, it, is, what, is, what it is they do and why they do it. Right. Obviously, lots of people who've been victimized through mol molestation. Presidents, politicians, Beyonce herself. <laughs> Beyonce. At the end of every interview, the murderer to Beyonce. The question everybody asks mm -hmm. that you mentioned is, was that okay? How was that? Everybody says that. And I, I now I just wait for it. Yeah. Was that okay? Was that okay? And when I finish, I'll say to you, was that okay? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you too. Okay. <laughs> You're very okay. You're doing very okay. okay. Very okay. Whew. Very okay. So what I started to feel, feel, sense, is that there's a common thread that runs through every interview. It doesn't matter what it is or what it is about. Everybody wants to know. And this is the truth. All of your arguments are really about the same thing. It's about, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did what I say mean anything to you? That's what everything's about. So the reason why I left my boss's uh, office when I was asking for a raise, I, could, I, I knew he didn't hear nor see me, neither, mm -hmm. and that I was not gonna get the validation that I needed. Now, I couldn't articulate that at the time. I just knew, let me get out of here. <laughs> but now I, I, I know, I could feel inside myself, I'm not gonna get the validation that I'm looking for. I also know that that's what every human being is looking for. They're looking to know are you fully here with me? Are you fully here or are you distracted? That's what your, that's what your children want to know. That's what your 
your, the people you work for want to know. That's what you want to know, yeah. is did you, did you hear me? And every argument isn't about whatever it is you think you're arguing about. It's really about, but can you hear me? And many people have even said it. Have you yeah. not said it? You're not hearing me. Yeah. <laughs> you're not hearing me. So having, having that understanding, and I would have to say that the show, one of the reasons why I live such a fantastic life is because I pay attention. I pay attention to my life. And your life is your greatest teacher. Every single thing that's happening to you, every day, your, your joys, your, your, your sadnesses, your challenges, your worries, your, everything is happening to bring you closer to in here. Everything is trying to take you home to yourself. And when you're at home with yourself, when you're solidly there, connected to whatever you call creation, even if you don't call it anything, connected to an energy force that, is, that has unlimited power for you, when you can connect it to, to that, you, you, you are your best. My greatest, one of my greatest lessons came from a guy who wrote a book called Seed of the Soul. I was doing them on the show and I started talking this consciousness, spiritual talk, mm -hmm. you know, two months after I started the, the show. And my producers would all be like, oh God, there she goes again. But I knew that even though masses of people were not tuning in for that, that the whole purpose of that platform was to try to lift people up. And now I have a network and I can articulate what it is I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring little pieces of light into people's lives. Because what is my job? My job is not to be an interviewer. My job is not to be a talk show host or just to own a network. I am here to raise the level of consciousness, to connect people to ideas and stories so that they can see themselves and live better lives. Thank you. I want to shift gears and focus okay. a bit on philanthropy. Are you worried about getting all your stuff in? Um, no, we're doing great. We're okay. just going to keep going. I think everyone likes this, right? We're good? Okay, good. good. Okay. So I watched your interview with the Forbes Conference on Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting, which was that early on, some of your biggest mistakes in giving were because you made emotional decisions. Yeah. And yet we learn here at the GSB, like one of the crucial messages we take away with us is that it's really important to be, as you said before, self-aware, to, to be understanding, often to share our emotions with others. And you yourself have been the master of you know, harnessing vulnerability with yourself and your guests over the years. So how do you strike a balance between emotion and logic? How do you make sure that you're making logical decisions when you're giving? Oh, these are so well thought out, these questions. <laughs> Thank you. OK, let me think about that for a minute. Very good. Thank you. OK. <laughs> well, I would have to say that you need both. You need emotion and you need logic. So in the beginning, I was purely emotional, made a lot of mistakes. Um, I happened to be sitting, I was sharing this story with um, Dean Soloner uh, just before he came on. I was sitting in Nelson Mandela's living room. And I'm not just saying that's a name drop. <laughs> but. I was actually sitting there. <laughs> you stayed with him, right? I stayed with him for stayed with him. I stayed with him for ten ten days, and as I said to the dean and Lisa, I could have I literally could have written a book called Twenty Nine Meals because I had twenty nine meals with him at that particular time. I wish I had. Yeah, you should. Uh, I, sh I should have. You should. You should do it now. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't record it, so something I think was that the second meal or the twelfth <laughs> meal. Anyway. Um, so I was sitting in Nelson, sitting with, uh, with Madiba, and we were talking about uh, how, how do you really make an impact in the world? And we were reading the paper, and we, I'd reached the point where I was no longer like, oh my God, what am I going to say? Because um, we were just sitting in silence reading the paper, and there was an article in the paper about you know, some tragic situation. And we both started talking about the way to end poverty is through mm -hmm. education. Right. And I said to him, I really, at some point, would like, like to build a school over here. 
And then he got up and called the minister of education and said, get over here now, Oprah wants to build a school. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> I didn't say I wanted to do it today. <laughs> but, um, so, but, but we literally started the process then. Wow. It was an emotional decision for me in that I think philanthropy should come out of you. Your, your doing should come out of your being. Everybody knows my story as a poor Negro child growing up in apartheid Mississippi. And if it were not for education and being born at the right time, because I was literally born in the year of desegregation. Five years before, three years before, two years before, nobody would have even had the hope that my life could have been any different. So because I was born at that time and literally moved out of Mississippi by the time I was in my first classroom, mm -hmm. I was in kindergarten, wrote my kindergarten teacher a letter, Miss New. I said, dear Miss New, I do not belong here. Oh because I know a lot of big words. And then I wrote every big word I knew. Elephant. <laughs> Hippopotamus. Mississippi. Nicodemus. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the Bible. So, and then Miss New says, who did this? I said, I did. So then they marched me off to the principal's office. Only time I was ever in there. Principal's office. Principal made me sit and write those words again. And I got myself out of kindergarten, into first grade. Oh my God. First grade, skip second grade, hello her. <laughs> the renaissance began. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've always had this conviction. You've always, it seems like you've always known who you are, no, even if you were Well, I knew I didn't it. belong there you with those that. kids. <laughs> In kindergarten, you're sitting there. That's what I'm trying to listen to your instincts. You look around and you say, these kids, <laughs> they are playing with some blocks. You're like, I don't do that. And I know Nicodemus. <laughs> I do not think I belong in here. I do not belong in here. So my point is, <laughs> my point is, education really opened the door, as yeah. we all know. I'm not going to give you the education speech. How do you change a person's life? I had, prior to um, starting my school in South Africa, I had this big idea that I was going to, emotional, mm -hmm. that I was gonna take all 100 families out of the projects and green and green, and I was gonna give them a new life, and I was mm -hmm. gonna buy them homes and stuff. And that did not work. Yeah. It w failed miserably. I had a big sister program that I started, failed miserably. So I realized that for me, First of all, I realized you don't change, as you all are recognizing through the SEED program, you first have to change the way a person thinks and <clears throat> sees themselves. So you've got to create a sense of aspiration, a sense of hopefulness, so a person can see, can begin to even have a vision for a better life. And if you can't connect to that, then, 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 you, then you lose. You lose and they lose. And it's just money after money after money. So for me, it's... Um, using my philanthropy to do what I have found to be enormously uh, uh, helpful, you know, the light in my life was education. Mm -hmm. So for me, in the beginning when I started to make money, especially when it's published, everybody and their brother calls Comes you. Over, yeah. And then you've got to make a decision. Am I going to do what everybody else wants me to do? Or am I going to be led by, by who I really am? And I learned as will happen to anybody who's successful in your family, people start treating you like the first national bank. And you've got to decide, you've got to draw the boundaries for right. yourself and decide how are you gonna use your money, your talent, your time in such a way that it's going to serve you first because if, you, if it doesn't allow you to be filled up then you get depleted right. and you no you longer want to, it. you can't, can't keep doing it. Right. So my decisions are now emotional and logical, meaning mm -hmm. I choose education, but I do it in such a way that's actually gonna benefit the person that I'm serving. Then it's not just, oh, I wanna help right. people, you know? Right, yeah. thank you. So to move on to our, our last part, you said at the end of your 25 years, gratitude is the 
single greatest treasure I will take with me from this experience. <clears throat> so now you've started your own network mm -hmm. and you continue to be very involved in your philanthropy and your school. Is there anything left that you're scared to try? <laughs> Whoa, Amanda. You must have been up all night long. I compared a little bit, just a little. Oh my goodness, anything left that I'm scared to try. Um, no. No, and I'm just trying to think, what, I'm trying to think, well, is there something that, that I hadn't thought of? Well, because there's not much you haven't done. So. Well, <laughs> but I stay in my lane. Yeah. I say I know what my lane is. I know what my lane is. Mm -hmm. I know that my real calling is um, what, I, what I said earlier. Yeah. It's not, I know what it looks like to the rest of the world. Oh, there's a talk show, so mm -hmm. but I really know what I'm here to do, right. which is the number one thing I would say to you. The, first, let me answer your question. So no, mm -hmm. there's nothing I'm not, I'm not scared to try. I haven't even, I, I have hit my stride, but I haven't done what I ultimately came to do. There still is a supreme moment of destiny that awaits me. And I also knew that during the Oprah show. I kept it, I've kept a journal since I was 15 years old. Oh, it's ah. so pitiful when you go back and see how pathetic you were <laughs> as a person sometimes. But I always knew, even during that show, that the show, we live in a fame culture. We live in a fame-centered world, you know? Had this literally been during the Renaissance, people would have valued different things. If we'd been during the Transcendentalist period, people valued different things. Right. But in our culture, we value fame. So I always understood that that was the basis mm -hmm. for me being known in the world because people wouldn't be able to hear you unless you came with some swag or swagger, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also understood that that was just the foundation to be heard, but that there was a lot more to be said. So. For me, owning a network or being a part of a network is about continuing to use that platform to, to raise the consciousness. I do a show on Sundays, which you can stream Super live, Soul. called Super Soul Sunday, <laughs> where I literally talk to thought leaders from around the world and ask the questions, not as good as you, I'm gonna consult with you, uh, <laughs> ask the questions in life that really matter, to get people thinking about what really mm -hmm. matters in their lives. And the responses that I get from people just regarding that show, let me know that I'm, I, I'm on mm -hmm. the right track, I'm moving mm -hmm. in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm not afraid because I know that all of us have limited time here, yeah. but the real question is who are you and what do you wanna do with it? And how are you gonna use who you are? My favorite line from, from, from Seed of the Soul is when the personality comes to serve the energy of your soul, that is authentic empowerment. So as graduates of this great school, to take what you've learned here, to take what is a part of your nature and what you've developed as skills and what, you, what really feeds your, your passion, to take that and to align that with the deeper potential and possibility of your soul's coming. When you align your personality with what your soul came to, and everybody has it, align your personality with your purpose and nobody can touch you. And you wake up every day and you are fired up. You just, it's like, oh my God, another day. It's so great because everybody has a purpose. So your whole thing is to figure out what that is. Your real job is to figure out why you're really here and then okay. get about the business of doing that. Okay. That's it. So we all know now what we have to do, right? When we leave? <laughs> yeah. So I, Oprah, thank you so much. Are we gonna take some questions? Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. I'd and love everybody to has a class up. at 115, right? Okay, I'll get you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> they told me hard out, one yeah. o'clock. But um, so I think we have, do we have a first question from Twitter coming forward? Throughout the session, the first question asked today was Matt Sacido, who asked, "Will you marry me?" <laughs> oh, it looks like he's up there. He's 
We, uh... <laughs> Matt, where's the ring? Matt, do we, do, do we, do we need marriage? <laughs> Oh my God, that's gonna be such a prenup between us, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got, Andre? Thank you. And, and then we had Javier Hernandez, <laughs> who asked, Oprah, who has been your favorite interviewee and why? Well, actually, um, I would have to say, I, I, there's so many over the years, and uh, the truth is that the, people whose names that I can't even remember, and you probably wouldn't remember, have been the most revelatory, the most impactful. I mean, watching people step out of tragedies and, 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 and define triumph for themselves, those people really have been the ones that really shaped me and made me a better human being. Um, I did an interview once with a woman, and actually with Dr. Phil, where she had come to the show and was planning to kill herself afterwards, she said, because her daughter had been murdered eight uh, years before and she couldn't get past it. And she just wanted to come on, on the Oprah show and talk about it. And Phil said to her, um, why do you spend all your time lamenting, all these years lamenting the death instead of celebrating the life? You've let the one day define your daughter's entire life. And she looked up at him and she said, you know, I never thought about it that way before with tears. I could feel that, that the shift in her. So the most important moments for me have been when literally I can see that somebody has made a shift in the way they see themselves in the world or, you know, what we call now an aha moment. Those, I, I live for that. I live for that. Those are, those are my favorite interviews. But most recently, I just uh, last week interviewed Pharrell. Yeah, we... <laughs> oh, oh my, my God. <laughs> I was you made so him cry. Happy. <laughs> but you made him cry. I didn't make him cry. I didn't make him cry, Amanda. But he cried and it was but it was happy tears. Yeah, I, I would have to say. I don't go after I don't I don't actually no. try to, to, no. to make people cry. And if I and if I think it, literally we cut a lot of it because he yeah. went into the ugly cry. Oh. <laughs> he went in to the ugly cry. You could tell it was real. Yeah, yeah. it was very real. And yeah. so we said, we got to say to brother, brother cannot <laughs> walk out into the world with the ugly cry. It's okay to have a little sniffle sniffle, but then just like, right. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> But I could also feel him. I mean, I understand, you know why? Because I, I just loved him. I yeah. just loved him. Anybody who, and anybody who saw that interview, if you liked him a little bit before, you he really loved him afterwards because that's a person who's absolutely connected to and it. He, yeah. yeah, he knows his purpose. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's very he much connected to it. And mm -hmm. when he saw, he started crying when he saw the videos of people all over the world dancing to the happy song. There was a version made here, too. Here? Yeah. You, you guys did one, too? Yeah, I think some of the NBA ones, right? Raise your hand if you were in it. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't it make you happy to do it? Yeah. So he saw that video, like 30 seconds of video from people in all yep. these different countries, and the name of the countries were up. Yep. And he just felt the emotion and the impact of using his life in such a way that you're able now to touch all of those people, which is really what we're all looking to do. And all of us have the ability to do it at whatever level you are, at mm -hmm. whatever level. And I always say to people, oh, I have a big stage. Some people have a smaller stage. Some people have, you know, what's your stage? We're gonna take one from the audience now? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Got the mic. Um, <laughs> Introduce yourself, so. Um, hi, I'm Kirsten. I'm a second year MBA student here at the GSB. Um, so this week uh, at the GSB, we're hosting something called Climate Week to raise awareness about climate change among uh, the business students here. And um, so you've interviewed people like Leo, to Al Gore, President Obama on, on this really important issue. And so I want to see you get, get a sense from you of how do you navigate raising the level of consciousness um, around issues like climate change that are important, but also very complex and politicized. <laughs> we, came <pre> <laughs> we came prepared today, huh? Wow. I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> I do not know. If I knew that, we would I would have like made it a club and we would have 
I would have had everybody come join my environmental club. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. That is such a complex, beautiful question. And the fact that you were even asking it or engaged in the process of trying to figure out the answer thrills me, because that's what would happen here at Stanford. So, but I, I really do not have an answer to that question. <laughs> Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? You have to, because you can't end on a question yeah, I couldn't answer. Yeah, no, no, no. Here we go. We'll I came, just came here to get, get stumped, yeah. Um, hi, Oprah. <laughs> My hi. name is Melissa, and I wanted to know, how do you think about balancing selflessness with selfishness? Selflessness? With selfishness. With, uh, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> It's kind of the, the tension between putting yourself first oh, okay. and also taking care of others. Okay. Well, I would say this. There is no, you have no, everybody's heard the whole oxygen mask thing. Um, the truth is, you don't have anything to give that you don't have. So you have to keep your own self full. That's your job. You know. Um, one of my daughters is here today from uh, Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy. Stand up today so everybody can see you. <laughs> she, you're going to end your first year soon. Oh my God, it's the first year. Um, I say to the, my girls all of the time that your real work is to figure out where your power base is and to work on the alignment of your personality, your gifts that you have to give, with the real reason why you're here. That's, that's the number one thing you have to do, is to work on yourself, and to fill yourself up, and keep your cup full, keep yourself full. Now, I used to be afraid of that. I used to be afraid, particularly from people who say, oh, she's, she's so full of herself, mm, she's so full of herself. And now I embrace it. I, I, I consider it a compliment that I am full of myself. Because yeah. you only when you're full, I'm full, I'm overflowing, my cup runneth over. I have so much, I have so much to offer and so much to give. And I am not afraid of honoring myself, you know? It's miraculous when you think about it. First of all, for me, my father and mother never married. They had sex one time underneath an oak tree because she was wearing a poodle skirt in 1953. <laughs> and my dad, to this day, says, I want to know what's under that skirt. That's what I want to know. <laughs> he wanted to know what was under the skirt. They didn't really have a relationship. She wanted one, but you know, he went under the skirt and then that was it. And one time under the oak tree, bam, renaissance. Woman is born. <laughs> it happened there. That's why I know my life is bigger than that. My life has to be bigger as yours is, bigger than a moment, than a poodle skirt. It's much bigger. The design, the, the, the reason why I'm here is much bigger than, oh, I think I want to see what's under there. So the ability to, 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 to take care of that, to honor that, to honor yourself and that which is greater than yourself, that which cre was the reason for your being here, that, 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 there's no selflessness in that. Because only through that do you have the ability to offer yourself, your whole self, your full expression of who you are to the rest of the world. So I remember the very first time I had a life coach, they weren't called that at the time, but an expert on, who shared with our audience, the women, she did a list and say, where are you on the list? And literally in that audience, women booed her when she said, put yourself top of the list. This was in 1992. In 1992, the idea of being top of the, your own list was people like, how dare she, and she doesn't have children. I said, she didn't say abandon your children and go running in the streets. <laughs> she just said, put yourself at the top of the list. Nurture yourself, honor yourself. Stop the crazy mind chatter in your head that tells you all the time that you're not good enough.
because that's the number one, I found too, issue with everybody. Uh, the reason people say, you know, how, how is that, how is that? Is because you, you, you want to know how do you measure up. Well, to know that you're just being here, you're just being here. However that sperm, bam, hit that egg. <laughs> However that occurred for you, that your being here is such a miraculous thing and that your real job is to honor that, is to honor that. And the sooner you figure that out, oh, wow, wow, I'm one of the lucky ones. I got to be here. So how do you continue to prepare yourself to, 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 to live out the highest, fullest, truest expression of yourself as a human being? And I just want to end with this. Yeah. There are no mistakes. There really aren't any, because you have a supreme destiny. When you're in your little mind, in your little personality mind, where you're not centered, where you really don't know who you are, that you come from something greater and bigger, and that we really all are the same. When you don't know that, you get all flustered. You get stressed all the time, wanting something to be what it isn't. There is a supreme moment of destiny calling on your life. Your job is to feel that, to hear that, to know that. And sometimes when you're not listening, you get taken off track. You get in the wrong marriage, the wrong relationship, you take the wrong job, yeah, but it's all leading to the same path. There are no wrong paths. There are none. There's no such thing as failure, really, because failure is just that thing trying to move you in another direction. So you get as much from your losses as you do from your victories, because the losses are there to wake you up. The losses are to say, fool, that is why you go to school. <laughs> so that CBS can call <laughs> you. So when you understand that, you don't allow yourself to be completely thrown by a grade or by a circumstance because your life is bigger than any one experience. And if I had, I always ask people on Super Soul Sunday to tell me, what would you say to your younger self? Every person says, in one form or another, I would have said, relax, <clears throat> relax. It's gonna be okay. It really is gonna be okay. Because even if you're on a detour right now, and, and that's how you know, when you're not at ease with yourself, when you're feeling like, oh, <laughs> that is the cue that you need to be moving in another direction. Don't let yourself get all thrown off, continue to be thrown off course, when you're feeling off course, that's the key. How do I turn around? So when everybody was talking about, when I started this network, if I had only known, good Lord, how difficult it would be, um, the way through the challenge is to get still and ask yourself, what is the next right move? Not think about, oh, I got all of this. To what is the next right move? And then from that space, make the next right move and the next right move, and not to be overwhelmed by it because you know your life is bigger than that one moment. You know you're not defined by what somebody says is a failure for you because failure is just there to point you in a different direction. And that's all the Thank time you. I got right now. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock. Thank you. Woo! Whoa. Good job. Thank you. Yay! Yay! Good job. Wow.